Welcome to the Partnernomics Show, where industry thought leaders discuss the hottest topics in partnerships, ecosystems, and innovation. The Partnernomics Show is brought to you by IOLife Solutions, a product incubator specific to Salesforce. Now here's the host of the Partnernomics Show, Mark Brigman. Welcome back to another episode of the Partnernomics Show. It's great to be with you today. Nice and cold January, I know at least all across the U.S. I was talking to some folks in uh, Europe this morning, and it's cold there too. So I guess it's uh, just that time of year. But I am super excited uh, for today's episode. Uh, multiple reasons. I get to introduce you to Patrick Griffin. Uh, Patrick, I've really enjoyed uh, collaborating with him. And uh, Patrick is our lead instructor for a new initiative that we're kicking off to take our strategic negotiations course and put it into a cohort format. So today's episode is going to be centered all around uh, the topic of negotiations, what that is, but then also we want to share a little bit of background of you know why we're taking our strategic negotiating course and putting it into a boot camp format and what we think uh, people will be able to get out of that. But Patrick, how are things going? It's great to see you again. Uh, it's great to see you too, Mark. Uh, things are great. I'm excited about uh, the relaunch of this of this program, the shift to the cohort based structure and uh just excited to to get the word out there i think the content is fantastic and i i look forward to guiding some folks through it so patrick you and i connected a while back and we we're just talking about our, our respective backgrounds and areas of, of interest and you had talked about negotiating and how you had led some courses um through negotiations i told you you know we have a course i'd love for you to check it out and you did that um, and I'd, I'd love to learn some more, kind of just share uh, your background in negotiation and, and how you've led uh, live workshops. Sure. Uh, so I really got my, um, cut my teeth in negotiations when I was young. Uh, even before I entered the professional sphere, I found that I was drawn to it, you know, rhetoric and, and the art of structuring, uh, you know, position and argument was something that always attracted me. And so when I moved into the professional space, I was working with company called Moody's Investor Service out of New York and um, and selling bond ratings. And so these this sphere is really relationally driven. They're kind of long tail sales cycles, but then they tend to be very sticky. And they were still operating at the time fairly transactionally. And so one of the things I did, and this was interesting because it required both internal and external negotiation skills, both with my peers and, and with my clients, customers, uh, was was to move everybody towards longer term agreements. So getting past that transactional mindset towards a relational mindset. And as that evolved, I, I picked up uh, pricing strategy responsibilities at the firm and they brought in some trainers and we got to, to learn more about how to negotiate effectively in a, in a formal sense. And over the course of my 10 years at Moody's, I negotiated a little, little over a billion dollars in contracts and just loved it. It was my favorite part of the job. And so when I left the firm about six years ago, seven years ago, I found that I had I had less need for formal negotiation. And I wanted to keep those skills fresh. And I also felt that I had some some information to share. So I moved to a new geography. I was in, in central New York working with smaller businesses in a smaller community. And I put together, I built this training program myself based on my experience, a number of books that I've read on the subject and the formal training I received at Moody's. So I started teaching it at a local business incubator uh, to some professional service groups in the area, um, and and then as well as some folks in Nashville, including uh, some executives in that space. And I really did that to keep my skills fresh and share my expertise. It's just the love of the art, really. And um, so I was I was pleased to have the opportunity to build that, and then thrilled when I got to review your content that that you had built with Mike Millick, because it's really tremendous, really well put together. Uh, immersive and intense, and uh, I'm proud to be part of it now. Yeah, we're we're excited to have you. Excited for this uh, this initiative. Um, I had the opportunity to to meet Mike Millich uh, oh, several years ago, probably seven years ago now. And I mean, just as we all know, right? You're putting deals together, just negotiating is just a natural piece of the work that partnering professionals do. And so Mike had a three-day workshop that he had been delivering for 10 years across the world, literally. And uh, so he was working with uh, a Fortune 10 client at the time 
putting multiple teams through his workshop. And I just like begged him. I was like, I want to go. Can I please come? I want to see your workshop live. I just want to see like what it is. And so we went down to Dallas and I, I spent some time with him as he delivered it. And, you know, like you, I, I don't know what the number is, but it has to be at least, especially if you include amendments, probably seven, eight, nine hundred, um, you know, quote unquote contracts or agreements uh, that I've put in place. Been through, I don't know, probably four or five formal courses during my 13 years at Sprint and at other organizations, crank, cranking through different cool books that's out there, uh, getting to yes. I'm looking at my uh, bookshelf now, uh, never split the difference. There's there's several different books that are out there uh, around negotiation, but I had never seen like a structure laid out like Mike had shared and kind of more specifically having a structure that's, I mean, it sounds cliche to say the win-win, but man, there's so many other programs that I've seen that are around you know, manipulation or coercion or kind of hiding information and in partnerships, it's a long-term game. It's a long-term relationship. I mean, it's, you're not going to buy a car and you're not going to see the the salesperson ever again. I mean, you have to live with this person. And so relationships matter, trust matters. And so I'd love for you to just kind of talk about, you know, this, the course that you had put together, you had delivered and how it might be similar or different than the course that we use that uh, Mike Millich had created for us. Sure. Uh, and you really hit the nail on the head with with the aspect of Mike Millich's program that that um, resonated with me the most is that that methodology, uh, the structural aspect of approaching and then engaging in a negotiation. And so my program that I built uh, was was similar to an extent, I, I would say that it was a, a it encompassed a portion of Mike's program because I think his is, is a deeper examination of best practices. Uh, but a lot of mine was working to dispel common misconceptions about negotiation. We have this pop sensibility of negotiations as inherently adversarial and uh, and shifting people also, as you said, to a more relational view. It's fairly unusual that in negotiations we have a one-off uh, engagement with a party and then never speak to them again. And so maintaining that credibility and working with people on a on a genuine, you know, ideally transparent basis to build something together is, um, I think, really applicable in both our professional and private lives. And it's been my experience that people negotiate far more often than they think they do. Yeah, no question. No question about that. Well, let's kind of dive into some different topics here and hit this one. I think one that you both you and I find interesting, and that is, uh, what are some of the big misconceptions that you know a lot of professionals might have about negotiations negotiation skills kind of like how negotiation is done sure so this is something i speak about a lot uh, with with folks i meet and folks i teach and the primary one is is what i just mentioned so this idea that that there is an inherent adversarial nature to negotiations it's us versus them uh, and one thing I do when I'm teaching courses, when we're fortunate enough to be doing it in person, is is I'll set people aside to work on a case study together uh, or take opposite sides of a negotiation. And then they will invariably sit on opposite sides of the table when we come back after they've done their little study. And I'll let them do that. But after a few minutes, I'll actually make everybody get up and I'll make them sit on the same side of the table, which sounds a little bit hokey, but it's it's intended to really be a realignment of thoughts that... Ultimately, negotiations in a business-to-business -business environment, in partnerships environment specifically, is about jointly solving problems, jointly treating each other's issues and trying to build something together. And so working against each other is not, is not what we're trying to do. We are trying to, to align ourselves, solve the same problems together. And a big part of that is just, you know, can be aided with the physical orientation of facing in the same direction. And another aspect that I hear very often from from people who want to understand negotiation better or feel that they understand it well, is this idea that there's always a winner and a loser in negotiations and that it's it's ultimately some version of a zero-sum outcome. And that's just so fundamentally wrong-headed. And I, I, I don't fault people. There's, there's really a, a pop culture sensibility that that's what negotiations look like. But it's unnecessary and it's unhelpful. And I think when we understand that 
that you know there's this concept in negotiations growing the pie that this myth of a fixed pie and so when we expand our thinking and really have done our research and preparation to understand the ways in which we can add value and the ways in which our counterpart can can help enable uh, us and vice versa is that we start to realize that we can grow this pie and collectively build something greater you know have those synergies build something greater together than than just simply this transactional exchange where somebody loses. Yeah, whenever I think about negotiating and you know, like you've mentioned the word value a couple of different times, I think. And if we think about it, like partnering, working with other organizations, I'm, I'm an economist, so I have to geek out. Last weekend, I was teaching a, an international executive MBA program. So all the content's fresh in my head from that weekend. But what makes um, partnering possible is that companies have a difference in cost, essentially, meaning some organizations are better, more efficient. They can provide uh, something at a lower cost than what we can. So it makes sense to team up with them, whether it's marketing, it's providing leads at some level of expertise, technical, whatever the case is. And so I love what you mentioned about um, you know, the antithesis of the zero-sum mindset. Because we typically, I think, naturally, maybe even subconsciously go into conversations and think that our potential partner or our partner, uh, they have the same constraints, the same business models, the same resources, and the same challenges that we do. And in a lot of cases, that's not necessarily true. Uh, But it's through that effective conversations and peeling the onion as i like to say but it's kind of digging around you know deeper i mean what's and understanding what's in this relationship for you uh what are you trying to get out of it what what are your strategic goals what resources do you have to work with now let me explain what things look like from my side i just always envision this venn diagram and the more healthy discovery conversations you have You know, the closer you bring those two circles together and you see all of this overlap where there's these these value propositions. But to me, a huge component of it is just effective conversations, effective discovery to understand the value that another organization wants and the value that they can bring. Sounds super simple, but there certainly is skills to get into that. Certainly. And one of the one of the topics, one of the uh, sort of points of guidance in Mike Milich's program is also helping to identify or seeking to identify the areas where your counterpart has those cost advantages or those value advantages and identifying things that are particularly valuable to you and particularly lower cost for your counterpart. And that's really where where we can find those efficiencies because then your counterpart, you know, they don't feel like they're giving up quite so much, but you feel like you're getting a tremendous amount of value. And as you start to stack those observations and ask those questions and have those those engaging you know, conversations with open-ended questions and discovery, you can identify more and more of those opportunities. And that's when it gets really good. And that's when you you start to to ramp up and engage that that engine to to grow together. Yeah. Um, I just want to toss this out there, hopefully on the on the front end of this uh podcast recording. Um uh, for people that have uh, an account on partnernomics.com, you get the first week of the course for free. So not trying to do a hard sell job, but come in and see it. See it for yourself. Keep your credit card in your pocket. You don't need it. Come and see what, you know, the structure of the course and what, you know, is there to learn. I know like whenever I was leading teams uh, at Sprint, still the vast majority of our folks, I was a Fortune 50, at, you know, at the time, uh, they had not been through uh, a formalized course in negotiation. So come in, check it out and just get an overview of of what's in those components. But I want to let you know, you get that uh, full lesson for free. Um, Patrick, I want to hit you with like another question or topic. And that is uh, certainly in my career, I've I've talked with different folks and talked about negotiation and, and what it's kind of done for me. But I'm also commonly surprised how often I hear people say, yeah, we really don't, I don't negotiate my job. You know, I, I don't work with partners or I'm not kind of partner facing. I'm not customer facing. Um, I don't negotiate. So, you know, it's probably not a skill that I need to spend time working on. 
What's, uh, what's your response when you hear that? I think that that, and I've heard that so many times. And and fundamentally, it's a it's a function of lens. I think is how you understand negotiations, um, how how you view them, and and again, part of dispelling some of these misconceptions. But I negotiate in some capacity every single day, and in a workspace, um, as I mentioned before, there's internal negotiations, there's external negotiations, and sometimes internally, they're really formalized, where you're laying the groundwork for a service level agreement with another division within your company. Um, but other times it's just, uh, you know, working with your counterparts internally to make sure that you're, you know, outside of the formality of, a, of an SLA, meeting each other's expectations, serving each other's needs and issues and helping resolve those things. And, you know, you mentioned earlier the example of, of buying a car, that, that transactional experience. And that's the one that people people think of. It's a great go-to example, but people only do that every, you know, depending on the person, every three to five or seven years sometimes. But what you find is uh, as you start to think of negotiation as this concept of mutually solving problems when it's in the relational or partnership context, uh, when you open your eyes to that, you'll see it each and every day. I was talking to my wife just before this call about how we load the dishwasher. And, um, and so, you know, this was a combination. That only happened at my house. <laughs> <laughs> I am uh, apparently awful at it, um, but, um, but I'm learning. And so some of this is, is, you know, there's a, there is at times a, a fuzzy line between conflict resolution and, and negotiation or compromise and negotiation, which really are different entities. Um, but working that out and, in, and engaging in a productive and collaborative uh, and often innovative way to solve those problems together uh, very often looks like and very often is negotiation. Yeah. Uh, I want to jump over to another topic that, that I really love. And, and that is, and I think another really big misconception when it comes to negotiating, and it's centered around information, information sharing or information hoarding. And uh, I just think back to a lot of times, both internal inside of my organizations, as well as whenever we were working with doing a negotiation with another company, how many times uh, professionals tend to hoard and protect information. They see it as power uh, and they don't want to give power away. So they hoard it and protect it. Um, talk to us a little bit about, you know, just kind of this art and the science of, of information sharing and how we should think about information sharing in a negotiation. Sure. Oh, well, that's that's paramount. So I, I wrote a post the other day, a little thought exercise about the concept of anchoring and negotiations. And I was speaking about how um, fundamentally the landscape of a negotiation is often dictated by uh, by the availability of information. Um, and, and oftentimes it's a, uh, the, the end result of a negotiation is, ex is an exchange of quite a bit of information along the way. We call it the dialogue phase in, in Mike's paradigm. But it's absolutely crucial now, from a partnership perspective, we do celebrate an effort towards transparency. It doesn't mean, though, that you need to share all of your information. You're not going to be an open book. You still have proprietary concerns as an entity. Um, you still have things that just wouldn't necessarily be productive for the conversation. So you do need to be tactical in how transparent you are and in the information that you release. However, I do think that everything you hold back can get in the way of that discovery and that diagnostic effort to provide mutual value to each other. So you need to be judicious about what you don't share and, and make sure that it's not getting in the way of you accomplishing your goals. So you can keep a tight, you know, you can keep your cards to your vest uh, for many things. And, and it's certainly appropriate in a commercial environment, as long as it's not working against your purposes. So sharing and having these, this open dialogue allows us to discover and and merge that Venn, di Venn diagram as you described. It's just finding those ways to work together and provide mutual value. And if you're playing everything so close to the chest, you're going to miss out on opportunities for that. Thinking back uh, to a workshop that uh, that I was 
at with with Mike Millich in a conversation that he was was having with a with a lady, and you know she said I find myself doing just that, just kind of like hoarding and protecting this information. And Mike's like, well, what are you trying to to get them to do? And she describes it, and he's like, why don't you tell them that? <laughs> if if you need to kind of paint this picture of what what's in it for you, what's in it for them, what's the value play, but make sure that you position that information and information can only be valuable and, and, and helpful if you use it. You just need to know how to use it. And to your point, what to use, certainly there's information that you don't want to share that won't be productive or constructive for what you're trying to do. But, um, you know, but the only way that we could get our partners to deliver the value that we want or to even consider the opportunity that we have is to paint the picture, lay it out there for them, what we're looking for in an ideal partner, what we want them to sign up for, what we're willing to sign up for, what our abilities and resources uh, that we can bring to the table in the relationship and take a more trans i would encourage people to take a more transparent approach to i'll call it partner recruiting or or even opportunity recruiting with existing partners but we want we want to know what we're getting into we should want our partners to know as much as possible exactly what they're getting into uh, that way we can manage to that. You know, we're not moving the target downrange. And uh, I think information share is a huge piece of that. But so many times I see professionals take the opposite approach of, of kind of hiding this in. Um, Mike talks a lot about power and, and even specifically doing a power analysis and a lot about preparation whenever, you know, you get into a negotiation you know, Mike teaches us four phases model with preparation, then dialogue, then making proposals, and then closing the deal. That's those four. Talk to us a little bit about like even the preparation piece and some work that professionals need to do um, in order to go into uh, a conversation and to be able to you know position the opportunity appropriately. Sure. So. A big part of the preparation. Now, one thing I want to say actually about those four stages is they they seem linear, but one thing we talk about in the in the curriculum quite a bit is that the dialogue phase should lead to a proposal, and they'll often circle back to the dialogue phase. And so it there is some movement within there, and you might even go back to preparation phase if you're preparing for you know yet another conversation. But a huge part of it is is developing an understanding of your core competencies and that of your counterparts. And, uh, you know, we talk about, you know, in the partnership space, it's the tremendous power of account mapping. And it's largely, a, uh, that's applicable, I should say, to this exercise as well, because we want to understand and want to endeavor, do our best to understand what we're good at in a way that's relevant to our counterpart. What are our areas that are maybe low cost for us and high value to them? What are we just better at or, or good at? And even if you have firms of, of uh, that, are, that are lopsided, so the counterparts where one is just massively more powerful, much larger, you know, maybe they're a Fortune 500 going up against, you know, working with an enterprise company. That doesn't mean that the negotiation is going to also be lopsided. And so this is where you're able to prepare and identify those ways to, to really highlight and develop an understanding of the power that you bring to the table from a from an organizational perspective that that allows you to have those productive conversations and meet as equals with this larger, more complex organization. So working to understand, uh, as I said, your core competencies, your efficiencies, the things that you're that you just have that you know particular capability for that gives you an advantage within your own sphere. And then also extending that to understand as much as you can of those same functions for your counterpart. That way, when you get to the dialogue phase, you'll also have more informed questions to ask. And you'll be able to exchange, you know, engage in that exchange of information that identifies, you know, more issues, more opportunities, and that that mutual growth that we're really seeking. 
Yeah. Hey, Patrick, I'm really excited to have you leading this course, uh, leading the the cohorts. Uh, we've offered this course for years and uh, man, it's super powerful, but now we've decided to launch it in a cohort format, a seven week cohort format. So if you would I'd like for you to just kind of describe somebody's out there interested in learning what it takes to get into a cohort, um, what do what do they need to do and what's the format? Sure. So we've broken down this curriculum into, into six week segments. And after each week, so you'll viewers, students, so to speak, will watch these videos and then we'll come back and we'll meet in a cohort function. And we'll do that every week for six weeks. And that's really uh, how that structure works. But what we like about changing it to this format and having that, that mixture of synchronous and asynchronous study is, you know, I always think back to, um, there's a there's a, a Bible verse that says, as iron sharpens iron, you know, so one man or one person sharpens another person. And I really think that having that socialization and that opportunity to to discuss in a live format these lessons and and best practices in a way that helps you develop your own understanding is really crucial and I think will will supercharge many participants' ability to, to get as much of they, as they can out of this program. Um, I know that that when I, well, so I'm, I'm studying German on the side. I, I used to be able to speak German a little bit and, and I'm working on it again. I'm trying to get it back. My sister lived in Germany for years and so she's fluent. And now she and I only text in German and I'm struggling and I'm trying to keep up, but I get better every single time we talk because we get to, work together and think in real time and sharpen those skills collectively. And, and I think the same will be true of this cohort based programming. And then the extra benefit, I mean, partnerships, professionals, I think are really, really inclined towards networking and getting to know each other and building those relationships. And so uh, I'm also participating in your orchestrator program that you're rolling out and coming into it. I have, um, a peer that I've known that actually introduced the two of us, Mary Hand. And uh, and she and I speak about the course content that we're going through. We talk about it even, even before we get together during our meetings to discuss that content, because that that social reinforcement is certainly for me a, a very effective way to undergird my learning and develop my understanding. And I think that'll be true for the folks going through the cohorts as well. Yeah, the cohort experience is so strong. It's one thing to go through a course to just learn the content. That's kind of what all of us did in college. Uh, where in the cohort side, we really focus on the implementation. Um, and, and you get an opportunity to learn just the point that you're making, Patrick. You have an opportunity to hear, you know, up to nine other people, 10 other people, with uh, including themselves, of what their experiences are. Maybe some challenges, some opportunities, some examples of how they've come, you know, come into these different scenarios and how it played out and maybe a different approach that you might take in the future. So the live interaction and really focusing on the implementation of these best practices inside of your organization is, oh, it's it's huge. It's so, so powerful. We've been running cohorts for, I think, six or seven years now with some of our uh, standard partnernomics uh, curriculum and it is so fun. They're they're really, really enjoyable. I know I've uh, enjoyed the ones that I've led, but Patrick, looking forward to working with you. Uh, looking forward to having you lead the cohorts. Uh, we have one that's uh, going to be launching here in just a few weeks. So um, encourage people to come, you know, jump on the website, check it out, take a look at it. If you don't already have an account, grab a free account. The first week of content's free. It'll give you an idea of uh, kind of an overview of what to expect in that. But Patrick, if people want to connect with you directly and just ask questions, how can they do that? Uh, so I am uh, pretty easily accessible via LinkedIn. Um, I also have a, a consultancy that I recently launched. So I'm available at Patrick at morriganadvisors.com. That's M-O-R-R-I-G-A-N. And, uh, and I could talk about this stuff all day. So I really encourage anybody who's curious to reach out. I am thrilled that we get to work on this together and get to launch, relaunch this program as a cohort structure. And uh, and I encourage anybody who's curious about it to reach out because I don't think you'll regret it. And I think there's a um, 
a tremendous amount to learn uh, and, and build on here. Awesome. Thanks, Patrick. Thank you, Mark. Thanks for joining us for this week's episode of the Partnernomics Show. Don't forget to subscribe to get the newest episodes at thepartnernomicsshow.com. Special thanks to our sponsors, Iolite. To learn more about Iolite, visit iolitepro.com. And Partnernomics, the science of partnering. To learn more about the suite of Partnernomics courses, coaching programs, and consulting services, visit partnernomics.com. See you on the next episode.